There is reason to believe that the events surrounding the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis tell us that we are about to see the return of Christ and the end of this world. God intervened in human affairs at that ancient time and changed the course of world history. Why? Because as God said at Genesis 11:6, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them if they were allowed to continue unhindered. We don't know how technologically advanced mankind had become at that point, except that they had started to build a city with a huge tower or skyscraper. But their trajectory was such that nothing they planned to do would be impossible for them. So God intervened dramatically to stop them in their tracks. What does that tell us about today's modern world, where human progress, unhindered by God, has led to space travel, artificially intelligent robots, and nuclear weapons? With modern man tunneling under the English Channel and decoding the human genome, it seems that nothing will be impossible for us if we continue as we are. How far will God allow that to happen? Let's take a close look at what happened at the Tower of Babel and its implications for our world today. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word, the Bible, to teach us, to instruct us, to make us wise, to let us know where we came from and where we're going. We thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful things recorded in your word. And you'll pray, we pray that you'll shed light on it as we look at your word this morning together. And we thank you for the opportunities to lift our voices together in songs of praise and worship to you. We pray your blessing now in the remainder of this service and on everyone who joins us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in praising the Lord as we sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray some 2,000 years ago, he gave them the words of the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer. Christians have been making it their own prayer down through the centuries. 
Let's do that now as we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Bible Nook ministry hosts a weekly remote Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 o'clock Eastern Time on Wednesdays. You're welcome to join the informal study by phoning 951-799-9542 or by clicking the Zoom link posted on Facebook. Bible Nook also provides free online resources in the form of websites at a dozen different domains. At the tobbible.com domain, we provide a free modern Bible translation that is copyright free. At the bibleforthendtimes.com domain, we provide a Bible that can be read online or downloaded for free and features footnotes highlighting and discussing passages on the end times the last days, and other important prophecies. At doorstepbible.com, we provide a free Bible in digital PDF format with footnotes that enable you to answer Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to your door. Our answerjw.com website provides other extensive resources on that cult, including a free online version of the book how to Rescue Your Loved One from the Watchtower. Our leftbehindanswer.com website examines the Bible verses related to that controversial new teaching. And our unversusil.com website explores the roles of Israel and the United Nations in end times prophecy. Our comefollowjesus.net site offers an introduction to biblical Christianity for non-believers and new believers. And our main website, BibleNook.com, provides links to all of the sites I just mentioned and features lots of other helpful material. Our videos of worship services and individual messages remain online for streaming at YouTube.com slash BibleNook and at facebook.com slash biblenookministry. These services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. They're also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages, and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages, with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails, four of which you see here, reach millions of people. Toward the end of 2023, Facebook and Google reported more than a quarter million total views for our message on Israel in Armageddon. A flood of responses and comments including from many non-believers and many comments from inside Israel itself, proved that this video got many people thinking and talking about the gospel message. The quarter million views reported for that message shows that for a very small ministry with a very small budget, Bible Nook reaches a very large audience. During the year 2023, we received gifts totaling $5,326, and we spent $5,875 on web hosting and domains, post office expenses, Zoom, and our call-in conference line. And overwhelmingly, we spent on boosting messages on Facebook and YouTube. As you can see, we had a shortfall for the year of $549.
but my wife and I were glad to cover that from our own personal funds to keep boosting messages that were generating so much interest. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. To maintain our freedom of speech, we have not applied to the government for their approval as a ministry, but all the gifts we receive go directly to the expense of spreading Bible messages. If you're being blessed by this ministry, or if the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on our gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook 214 Onset Ave, Suite 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 11 in the New Living Translation, beginning with the first verse. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Now let's join together in singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Dying crimson 
There's reason to believe that the events surrounding the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis tell us that we are about to see the return of Christ and the end of this world. God intervened in human affairs at that time in ancient history and changed the course of world history. Why? Because as God said at Genesis 11:6, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them if they were allowed to continue unhindered. We don't know how technologically advanced mankind had become at that time, except that they had started to build a city with a huge tower or skyscraper. But their trajectory was such that nothing they planned to do would be impossible for them. And so God intervened dramatically to stop them in their tracks. What does that tell us about today's modern world where human progress unhindered by God has led to space travel, artificially intelligent robots, and nuclear weapons? With modern man tunneling under the English Channel and decoding the human genome, it seems that nothing will be impossible for us if we continue as we are. How far will God allow that to happen? Let's take a close look at what happened at the Tower of Babel and its implications for our world today. The timing was around 4,200 years ago. People in our modern age may assume that everyone lived in caves back then and hunted wild animals with Stone Age weapons. But the Bible makes clear that this was not the case. Even in modern times, primitive tribes, living Stone Age style, have been discovered on isolated islands off the coast of India and in the Pacific Ocean, as well as in remote jungle areas of Brazil, Paraguay, and Peru in South America. Isolated people groups have been found in all those places, hunting with bows and arrows, while their neighbors just a few hundred miles away we're using smartphones, watching television, and flying in airplanes. So when archaeologists dig up some relics of people 4,000 years ago who lived primitively, that does not rule out their having neighbors at the same time in history who enjoyed more modern conveniences and more advanced technologies. The Bible tells us that some advances in technology occurred within just a few generations of Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden. It says of Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel, when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. That was a rather simple and primitive existence. But then just five generations later, we read that Ada gave birth to Jabel, who was the first of those who raise livestock 
and live in tents. His brother's name was Jubal, the first of all who play the harp and flute. And during that same generation, Zillah gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. So very early on during human history, there were people using tools of bronze and iron and enjoying their leisure time by listening to music played on harps and flutes. Aside from that, we don't know what technologies were available to ancient peoples. But scientists still wonder at how the ancient Egyptians were able to build the mammoth pyramids thousands of years ago how they were able to collect such huge stones and move them into place with such great precision. An ancient Roman ship was recovered from the bottom of the sea where it sank well over 2,000 years ago. There were enough dated objects on board the ship, like statues, coins, and other easily dated items, to confirm that it sank around 100 years before Christ. And among the objects found on the ship was the Antikythera mechanism, printed, uh, pictured here, named after the Greek island closest to the sunken ship. I might have tossed it aside as an old piece of junk, but inquisitive archaeologists examined it closely using X-ray tomography and high-resolution scanning, and they discovered that it is an analog computer that operated without electricity. The Wikipedia describes it this way. The Antikythera mechanism is an ancient Greek hand-powered model of the solar system, described as the oldest known example of an analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. The precision mechanical parts are inscribed with tiny, very, very tiny Greek language instructions on how to operate it and how to read from it the movements of the sun, moon, and planets years in advance. Scientists have built models of what it must have looked like when it was built some 2,200 years ago. But to create an actual working copy of this ancient computing device, it would be necessary to analyze tons of astronomical data using our most advanced modern computers and then to translate all of that into precision mechanisms. Yet the Greek and Roman scientists who built the original hundreds of years before Christ had all of that knowledge and skill available to them in ancient times. The flood of Noah's day must have been a setback to the advance of technology, with mankind starting out again with just the skills and knowledge of the four men and four women who survived the flood. The historical record in Genesis tells us, the sons of Noah who came out of the boat with their father were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. From these three sons of Noah came all the people who now populate the earth. Since the worldwide flood had completely wiped out the complex society they came from, these survivors had to start over again with primitive agriculture. Genesis says, after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. But as they reproduced and grew in numbers, it was not long before they reconstructed a complex society with the potential for advanced technological achievements. The account in Genesis is not by any means a once upon a time fairy tale myth. Rather, it documents precisely the line of descent from Noah's sons and grandsons that led to the nations that we recognize in secular history. For example, Genesis chapter 10 records this genealogy for Noah's son Ham. The descendants of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Mizraim is the Hebrew name for Egypt, and Ham's son, Mizraim, became the ancestor of the Egyptian people. 
Genesis 10, 15 tells us Canaan's oldest son was Sidon, the ancestor of the Sidonians. The location where Sidon settled still bears his name, and it's the city of Sidon in modern Lebanon. And the Genesis account continues with these details of where Canaan's descendants settled. The territory of Canaan extended from Sidon in the north to Gerar and Gaza in the south, and east as far as Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim near Lasha. We recognize Sidon in the north as that city in Lebanon is still there today, and we recognize Gaza in the south. Gaza is in our news headlines almost every day now. Genesis gives us a lot of detail about Noah's descendants who settled on that land because it is the territory that would later become the promised land that God gave to the descendants of Israel. But Genesis also names Noah's other grandsons. And it says, these are the clans that descended from Noah's sons, arranged by nation according to their lines of descent. All the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great flood. But before the descendants of Noah spread out and settled the lands that came to be named after them, we find the episode at the Tower of Babel. The descendants of Noah's sons and grandsons at that time had grown in numbers, and yet they still formed one very large community of agricultural migrants still living off the land, not very far from where Noah's Ark had come to rest. The historical account in Genesis chapter 11 picks up what happened as their population grew. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, Let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the earth. That popular decision to live together in one city instead of spreading out over the world was directly contrary to God's earlier instructions. After the flood, God had told the survivors of the flood to fill the earth. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Remaining together in one city to keep from being scattered all over the world was directly contrary to what God said to do. Pooling all their resources and knowledge would also have propelled mankind on a much faster trajectory of technological progress than what God's timetable called for. So God intervened to put a stop to the people defying his command. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. God split up the population by assigning each family group its own language. The architects, engineers, and workmen working on the city and the Tower of Babel could no longer understand each other. A simple request like, pass me a hammer and nails, or please move that rock, could not be understood because each workman's language was foreign to the other. They could no longer work together, so the entire project had to be canceled. Each family group with its own language now split off 
to settle in an area by themselves. So God's purpose for mankind to fill the earth ended up being accomplished, despite the will of the rebellious people. And mankind's progress toward the scientific developments of our modern day was set back and postponed by thousands of years. God postponed human technological development by confusing the languages and scattering those ancient people. When they all spoke the same language, working together, before long, nothing would have been impossible for them, but God stopped them in their tracks. Why is this significant for us today? Because mankind today has overcome that impediment. Mankind today has overcome the language barrier that God imposed. If you visit the United Nations headquarters building in New York City, and an Arab leader is addressing the audience in his native language, you can use your headphones to hear him speak in your language, regardless of whether that be English, Spanish, Chinese, or some other. And you don't have to visit the United Nations building to see how language barriers are broken today. You can use a voice translation app on your phone to hold a conversation with someone who speaks a different language. Mankind has essentially overcome the language barriers that God imposed at the Tower of Babel. And since modern man is no longer hindered in technological progress, what God took action to prevent back then is happening right now. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. God stopped those ancient people from building their city with a tower that reaches into the sky. But now cities with skyscrapers are found all over the world. And cities with skyscraping towers are just the beginning of what mankind can now accomplish. Man can travel to the moon and back with plans underway for people to rocket to Mars and beyond. And ordinary people can fly around the world as easily as they can visit a nearby city. Yes, it seems that today's human society has broken the barriers God had set up so that now nothing is impossible for us. Mechanics and computer scientists are manufacturing artificially intelligent humanoid robots with the promise of making our lives easier. But they also terrorize some people with irrational fears about such robots taking over the world and becoming our masters. And they inspire other people with false hopes of gaining everlasting life by uploading their minds into a computer with a mechanical body. They make it appear that mankind can now do things that only God can do by creating intelligent life and by promising eternal life they make it appear that nothing we plan to do will be impossible for us. We can split the atom and nuclear power plants to provide electricity for a city full of homes, but we can also blow a whole city off the map with a single atomic bomb. Men can now create and destroy with godlike power. It would seem that nothing we plan to do will be impossible for us. Doctors today can work wonders, making the lame walk and the deaf hear, saving lives after traumatic accidents and repairing bodies damaged by disease. But they also violate the laws of nature and the laws of God by sex change surgery that mutilates women to make them look like men and mutilates men to make them look like women. Mankind has rolled back what God did at Sodom and Gomorrah by recreating Sodom and Gomorrah worldwide. And mankind has rolled back what God did at the Tower of Babel by breaking the language barrier God imposed and by empowering the rebellious human race once again so that nothing mankind plans to do will be impossible for them. How long will God put up with that? The apostles asked Jesus, 
What sign will signal your return in the end of the world? And Christ responded by giving them things to watch for. Jesus said, When these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. The things that Jesus said to watch for are found in Matthew's Gospel, in Mark's Gospel, and in Luke's, as well as in the Revelation or Apocalypse of John. The prophet Zechariah also wrote about the end times events, and so did Daniel and Ezekiel and other Old Testament prophets, and further hints can be found in the letters of the apostles. But seldom does anyone mention the Tower of Babel in connection with Christ's return and the end of this world. Jesus said that his return would be like the days of Noah when the flood came unexpectedly on a wicked world. And the Apostle Peter compared the end of this world to that world that was swept away by the flood. So it's valid to assume that we are facing the time of the end if our world today has become like that world before the flood. Peter also compared the approaching end of this world with God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's valid to assume that we are facing the time of the end if our world today has become like Sodom and Gomorrah. But God also intervened powerfully in human affairs at the Tower of Babel. He intervened to prevent a situation where nothing that men planned to do would be impossible for them. If mankind has overcome the barrier God set up and can now do the things God meant to stop them from doing, then the lesson of the Tower of Babel gives us another reason to believe that we are in the time of the end, the last days before the return of Christ. If you have not yet turned to Jesus in repentance for the forgiveness of your sins and not yet committed yourself to follow him as your Lord, now is the time to do so. And if you are already a believer walking with God, then you have reason now to stand up and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us the history of mankind in your word, the Bible, the important parts of history, the parts that relate to mankind's obeying and disobeying you. We thank you, Lord, for recording for us these events that we've looked at in this message. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help each one who hears it to ponder these things in their hearts and minds and to be motivated to turn to you in faith and trust and obedience. We thank you, Lord, for putting all these wonderful things into your word, the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. He's got the whole world in his hand. 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 He's got the wind and the rain in his hand. He's got the wind and the rain in his hand. He's got the wind and the rain in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the teeny little baby in his hands. He's got the teeny little baby in his hands. He's got the teeny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me sister in his hands he's got you and me brother in his hand he's got the whole world in his hand
Heavenly Father, thank you for refreshing us through the opportunity to lift our voices in songs of praise to you and to hear you speak to us through your written word, the Bible. Help us, please, Lord, to keep these things in our minds and hearts as we go through our week, sharing the gospel with others as we have opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. Our seven o'clock Wednesday evening remote Bible study and prayer meeting is studying the book of Acts now, using the Bible itself as our textbook. It's very informal, and you're welcome to join us anytime after 6.45 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesdays. Just dial 951-799-9542, and you'll be connected. Or click the permanent Zoom link that's posted on Facebook. God bless. Keep safe.